This is the OGM weekly call for Thursday, May 4th, 2023. Um, oh, good. You beat me to it. Captions are now on as well. <clears throat> I was just, just reaching for them. Uh, hey, everybody. How are you doing? Good. Good. Oh, excellent. Um, Many things swirling around in my head this morning. Uh, I was thinking we would continue the conversation about woke, wokeness, wokeism uh, that we started last week. I was trying to reset my, my brain into that conversation to remember where we were. Um, and uh, if you all would like to do that, let's do that. If not, let's find a different topic. But that was my instinct. Uh, thoughts? Preferences on on topic in that way? Something else. Something different? Does anybody feel strongly about pursuing woke and wokeism uh, any further? Nope. Okay. No, but I've, I've got a question. What's your question? Um, and I wasn't here, so I apologize uh, for missing last week. Um, uh, wokeism is one of those things that confuses me because it ends up getting double bound and triple bound and quadruple bound kind of. So the, the things that I, I can think of that are like that um, are fascism and Antifa or turfness. Um, uh, so it's always, uh, every once in a while, I'll start reading about um, how JK Rowling is or is not a turf. And then it's like the, the arguments go like levels of meta kind of that I can't follow. And so it, it ends up being really hard to understand where to be a, you know, which which side to be on and which meta side to be on and which meta 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 side to be on. And at some point it's like, I'm so confused. Um, so wokeism seems like a similar thing. So, so Pete, you want a discussion of modern culture? Um, no, how, how to cope <laughs> with that, you know, yeah um entanglement i guess yeah so we got we got into a piece of this last week um because uh, how to say this so so my impression is that woke just means you are awake and aware to injustices that have happened to people uh who mostly don't look like us in the room here now <laughs> um and that you might be willing to do something about it. that's all woke was meant to mean originally and what's happening? Well, is... ex except even that, I it's I, I think as I understand it, it's meant to be used by people who don't look like us. So then, if I say woke, I'm woke. So I there's feel a like that's a there's a, a whole parallel uh, conversation about what is anti-racism and who can be anti-racist and all of that. Uh, my own impression is that woke means, hey, people who caused this, are you woke? Is a fine and dandy thing. I don't think that this is. I don't think it's cultural appropriation for white folk to say that they might be woke or are trying to be woke. I don't think that's wrong at all. Does unless, they're, else? unless they're being appropriative or or uh, ironic. So uh, yes. If if people say it in good intent, then it's okay. If people say it in bad intent, then it's you know clearly. Yes. Now the place I wanted to get to quickly before we spin in 15 different directions was to directly answer your question, Pete, which is that my impression is that woke has been very intentionally uh, weaponized and spun into multiple meanings and turned back on itself uh, by people who are who who are, have basically turned woke into um, uh, a substitute for other racist words. Um, and are now happily using it everywhere. There's a war on woke, which is like, wow, okay, there's a war on people of color then just under a different name, except now it's being said all over the place. So your concern or confusion at the multi-layered meanings and all the different sort of uh, nested whatevers is the natural outcome of this word battle, this ontological coup that's going on around words that matter. And, and one, of the, one of the ironies that's in parallel here to me is that Antifa has turned into a terrible thing. And if you figure it out, it's like, ooh, that means anti-fascism. So if you're anti-anti-fascism, don't the antis cancel out? Um, and shouldn't that be simple math? But no, because Antifa sounds like a separate acronymy thing. And the moment you're on that, 
you're down a completely different rabbit hole. So, so we don't need to slide into this conversation because uh, there was some indication at the start of this call that this was not the, the pleasing topic of choice for today, but I'm happy to loiter here for a moment if this kicked up some dust. And Gilly, you were about to jump in a moment ago, but uh, uh, Stacy, sorry, I just saw your hand. The, the piece to that conversation that I think is important is how the woke changed, how the woke word changed. So initially, if somebody called me woke, I took that as a compliment. And the way that the emotion underneath how that changed is people feeling things were being forced down their throat. And so then they would say, oh, you're woke. And I think that that element of feeling that something is being forced down somebody's throat is really important for us to keep in mind for other topics as well, because that's something that keeps coming up. Thank you. That's it. That energy might well be a topic for this call. It's a near neighbor to woke, but it isn't woke. And it's about the dynamics that we're seeing going on. So it's a possibility. Thanks, Stacey. That's interesting. Gil. Yeah, I, I just put it in the chat. What I'm what I'm what I'm hearing in Pete's question and where this conversation is going is how do we navigate weaponized conversations? Uh, things get weaponized very quickly, they get polarized very quickly, they're litmus tests very quickly. And I have found myself self-censoring online to just, you know, being very wary of wading in where I may not know the context or people may have much more sensitive triggers than I do. And um, it, you know, it, 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 it's, I, I feel very disoriented in the modern conversations about, you know, Pete, you talked about woke and turf and, you know, Jerry raised Antifa and there's a whole bunch of others we could add to that. Uh, stuff gets very polarized and decontextualized very quickly. So, Pete, I'm, you, know, you know, I'm putting I, I don't mean to be putting words in your mouth, but what I heard you saying is how the fuck do we navigate this stuff? How do we have um, 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 generative edifying um, uh, forwarding conversations in the midst of this cultural conversational environment that we seem to be in these days? Is that, that makes good sense. And many of us are feeling like we're walking on eggs a lot, which is happening in, in this dynamic. Uh, Scott, Pete, Doug. Hey, everybody. Hey, Scott. Um, I learned a word a couple of years ago that I'd been looking for for 20 some years. It's the name of, you, you can call a, a, a hyponym. I think it's hypernym which is a word that encloses other words. So in other words, you have, you have golden retriever, you have dog, you have canine, you have animal. Those are, those are hypernyms. And I always wondered, what is the word that encompasses other words? And what I noticed with a lot of these is that it starts off very specific. And then to, I, I don't know if the, if the right word is weaponize it, but to because I think it's used on both both sides of the argument. If I make it more general, more hyponemonic, ooh, um, then you know what I'm talking about, right? And it's this whole well, we, it was something specific. And now it's become, oh, well, it's all of the woke or it's, it's well, well, you're on my side or you're not on my side, but we're not really talking about specifics anymore. We're talking about, oh, well, it's this generalized thing. Is this, if this even smells like that just a little bit, then I'm going to put it under this umbrella of woke where I've zoomed out so far that it's just this vague concept. And then on the other side, it's the sniff test saying, you know what, this feels anti-woke to me without being specific, without being precise about what, what it is we're talking about. So that's kind of what it feels like to me is as the, as the conversation goes on and the sides are drawn 
the sides become more vague and general instead of more specific. So that's that's my thought. Thanks, Scott. Pete, and feel free to take a pause before jumping in. I, I guess the um, a, a thinking through it in my head a little bit, um, uh, the, the, the situation in which we find ourselves is having conversations with many more people in many more circles in many, many much larger circles than ever before. And so this terminology problem isn't isn't really a problem if you get to sit down with a friend and and uh, with some honor and candor and deep listening and things like that um you can say so what do you mean by woke what are we talking about i thought i thought woke meant you know this is that what you're talking about you can have that context setting conversation um in in a way that makes sense and then you don't have problems you know you 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 chat out the the shared context under which you're you're talking about. So we have a different situation in the public square, um, which you know conceptually, if I say something like public square, um, I'm, I'm thinking of a big park and maybe some soap boxes or benches or something like that. And you know the, the people I'm talking to are kind of within shouting distance um, or or less. And so that conceptually is, you know, it, it goes from a, a, a intimate conversation with a friend or a few friends um, around a glass of wine and, and a coffee table to maybe a little bit larger thing. And that still feels like a conversation. And then, and then I think what happens is we collapse a situation like where I'm on Twitter and all of a sudden I'm talking to a million people and there are, you know, a hundred people in this conversation and they're on different sides and they have different things and a lot of them are in drive my mode um, 20 or 30 percent of them are bots and don't even care um and and i know i i know in my mind and so i, I suspect that many people think that those are all kind of the same thing oh i'm having a conversation i'm having a conversation i'm having a conversation and what really happened was we jumped out of you know, out of a situation that that humans have been dealing with for tens of thousands of years and into a situation which we think, you know, is similar, but it's not, it's not at all. It's a completely different beast. Um, uh, so, so in that, in that journey from uh, intimate conversation in a, in a living room to what feels like an intimate conversation because I'm still in my living room <laughs> on my laptop um, talking with what looks like people. Um, we, don't, we don't have affordances to help us understand that we've moved to a completely different situation. You know, it's like we went from a dinghy to an aircraft carrier and, and we're going, oh, well, it's still a boat. <laughs> it works the same. Um, if I need it to turn, it turns the same, you know, if I need it to stop, it stops the same and it doesn't, you know, so I, I think that's kind of the, the resolution for me that, um, you know, the context thing. A couple of things I'm reminded of, I'm reminded of being a, a young kid in Northern Nevada um, on, in elementary school, I think, and somebody came up to me once and said, are you a Northerner or a Southerner? And this was a completely new thing to me. Um, this is kind of like, uh, you know, do you speak Pig Latin, uh, Igpe, Atenle, Ixpe, or something like that. You know, it's like, huh, what's that? What's a Northern and what's a Southerner? It's like, well, if you live in the South, then, you know, you were against the, you were, you know, a rebel or against the Union or whatever. And if you were in the North, and it's like, on the West, that all that distinction kind of falls off. So, you know, already it didn't really make much sense to ask that question. Um, and, you know, and then I guess I had to pick sides, but I'm like, I don't know what side I'm picking. I don't, I don't know. Or I guess I'm a northerner because I live in northern, Cal uh, northern uh, Nevada, not southern Nevada. It's like, okay, now I know what side you're on. It's like, <laughs> okay, that's great. <laughs> I don't know how that helped us or, or how it didn't, you know. So 
another thing I'm reminded of, uh, you know, later in life, 30 years old or 40 years old, coming to a front door and, and uh, you know, some nice people, well-dressed nice people are going, hi, I'm here to wonder, you know, I, I'm here to, to ask you, do you believe in God? And as a literal minded person, this question is always just arresting, you know, because I know there's a socially acceptable answer, which is, yeah, of course, and a socially unacceptable answer, and at least in some circles, which is no, of course not. Um, uh, uh, and then there's the answer, which I really want to give. It's like, okay, so I, I, by your question, I think I, I understand that you believe I know what you mean by when you say God, but I have to say that it, what I'm thinking about God and what you're thinking about God and the other person standing next to you thinks about God, I think they're probably all the same things. We're talking about a pretty big concept here. And to, to start the conversation with, do you believe in God, you know, skips over like a whole bunch of, of context setting, you know? Um, so I, I, uh, there's a, there's a um, there's an answer that you can give in hacker circles for this question and hacker circles from m moons ago. Um, there's an answer. I think it's mu, uh, the letter mu, Greek letter mu. It means I can't answer your question because there's it, it doesn't there's no you know there's no context with, with within which to answer that question. So you know so we can stop talking or. Or, you know, we can get into a much longer conversation, which I don't think you have enough patience for, because I think that the discussion of whether or not there is a God and who she or he is, and if they are even uh, uh, human centric and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's a conversation that would take decades, probably longer than you have on my porch, you know. So um, that's maybe a, even a bigger question than are you a turf or are you an anti anti or are you woke but it's kind of the same kind of thing it's a, a conversation that we find ourselves in acts in, in in too much haste i guess and so the the answer is kind of slowing down somehow and i don't know how you do that on twitter so that's that's my my new uh my new wonder thanks thanks, thanks pete um start me You're muted. I can't help but feel it's a bit of a straw man to focus on words and weaponization of words and not drop below that to what's the underlying experiential human being dimensions of that. And ultimately language that um, characterized as weaponized is actually um, language that has been melded with an emotional limbic response. <laughs> and the real sort of, I think, subject du jour and focus that, that would be worthy of discussion and, and exploration is um, how do you take a a global population, or if you want to zoom into a US population that um, is in such a state of fear as a steady, as an underlying steady state of being that um, it takes so, so little to trigger um, a guy shooting five people in a waiting room yesterday because he was told no to a medication that he needed. Um, it's, uh, and this is sort of everywhere. So the, and, and the thing about, um, you know, Gil's, com Gil's share about, you know, watching his language and carrying that, and Jerry, you echoed sort of the similar walking on, on you know, tender, tender feet um, about what you say to who, where, when, and what you might trigger. All of that, you know, through one lens, you can sort of 
denature it and go, well, that's a oppressive impact on freedom of speech and all of that. You know, you can like intellectualize and abstract it. But the truth of the matter is that the level of fear and concern and, and, um, and trigger is much closer to the surface of the skin for many, 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 many more people than I think it's been in quite a while. And how do you speak to that? How do you um, bring back safety and security when, when uh, everybody's in fear of walking out of their door? And I'm complete. Thanks, Doug. Well, uh it feels to me like what Biden has been trying to do is a strategy for do, for that, which is say, hey, I'm here for all Americans and I'm going to go try to pass things that make your life better. And I'm not going to inflame things and go crazy and yell. And I'm going to ignore the people who are doing that kind of as best I can. And that is a strategy. I don't know that it's, it's it, it does not appear to be succeeding quite yet, but but it takes time for that strategy to sort of sink in. And the other side has to go about the business of blowing itself up, which it is presently doing. The other side is just spinning nuclear to mix poor metaphors. Ken, then Gil. I think I've told this story before, so apologies for those who've heard it, but um, I was once asked uh, back in 2004 to bring together a, a number of business people and peace activists, and um, I didn't want to do it because I find peace activists to be incredibly violent. They're like, no, oh, blood for oil. You know, they really take these extreme stands and now I'm for peace and you're for war. And it was just, I didn't want to do it, but I did. I was convinced to finally do it. And so, um, doing a world cafe with about uh, 80 people at the um, uh, formerly beyond war. I can't remember what it is now uh, foundation for global uh, something or other. Um, and uh, I said, so this is Jennifer. She's my graphic recorder. She's going to capture the visual output of today's conversation. And immediately somebody said, capture is war language. You can't use war language. And I was like, this is why I don't want to be in this room. Cause I have these people who are just so triggered by a word. Right. And I said, okay, fine. What would you use? What would you suggest? And they went, oh, uh, I don't know. I said, well, come up with a word. We'll use it. But right now we're going to use capture. And um, so there's a lot of anxiety and, and, and challenge in the room. And I, I asked people, I knew that we couldn't start talking about the challenge because from an Aikido move, that's meeting the energy head on, right? So instead, I, I asked people to tell a story. I said, you're at, all at tables of four. Please tell the story of the first time that you realized that peace was important to you. And we did two rounds of that. And it was really remarkable because most people went to a time when they were teenagers, when they tended to be a little bit more idealistic than they are as, as you know, cynical adults. And they told really touching stories of, of something that occurred in their life that made them realize that peace was important. And at the end of two rounds, there were no longer peace activists and business people. There were a bunch of people concerned with peace. And we had a really much more productive conversation. So I think... In terms of, I don't know how to de-weaponize a conversation on Twitter or Facebook or any other platform because because you do have those, you know, it's not a personal conversation. I think if you're in the same room or if you are um, in a Zoom room like this and you can see people's faces and you have appropriate facilitation and structure of the conversation, it's very possible to get past the weaponization. But out there in the larger world where there's, you know, all these forces of of intentionally weaponizing people to divide them so that you know the status quo can continue that's a much different animal that i do not know how to handle so i just go about it one conversation at a time um, and try to bring as much awareness as as possible um, and find questions that get people to to think what am i really concerned about here because if you shift from fears to concerns you know like what do we want why is this important then you get a very different tone and tenor of the conversation and a different level of participation Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Um, I want to step back to Twitter for a second because Pete brought it up and you brought it up and say that 
somewhere early in Twitter's history, I realized, oh, this is really interesting because two people can have a relatively intimate conversation in public. And if they ignore all the retweets and replies and everybody else being pesky and whatever else, if they just manage each other and have a conversation and pace it any way they want to, and these are variables completely within their control, it can be very intimate and work really well. And it can be a, a, a reliable, trustworthy, interesting conversation in public. It's when you get dragged into everything that everybody wants to do with you and twist you and turn you that it spins out of control. But those are just variables in your, in your control. The platform allows you to pretend those things ain't happening. Um, and I think that's valuable. And I don't think that's been destroyed quite yet, even though I'm pretty sure that that uh, Elon is busy, like, you know, putting a, a hole in the hull of the Twitter vessel. Um, Gil Lenmark. Jerry, I agree that it's possible. It takes the discipline of an Aikido master. You know, in other words, <clears throat> for people who are not practitioners of this stuff, to not, not well, sure it's that level because well, I, I, I've, let, I've let, met some Aikido masters let, and I'm never getting there. But I let can me do finish this. the thought. Let me finish okay. the thought. I mean, master may not be the right word. I'm using yeah. it to evoke something. It's, it's, it's for and for those who don't know this, it's a practice of re, of, of being centered and remaining centered um, even when perturbing things are thrown at you, which could be someone coming to punch you or throw you to the ground or come at you with a weapon or yelling at you or calling you names, is to be able to maintain center, calm focus in the face of that. And that's what you're talking about doing on Twitter where it's you know it's challenging, but yeah, it's a kind of practice all dojo. Um, yeah. Um, Ken, I really appreciate what you said. Um, I, I would, I, I've been using the word care instead of concern because concern for a lot of people means worry. What are you concerned with? Is like, what are you worried about? That's not what you're trying to get at. You're trying to get at what matters to you. You know, what do you really care about? And so, to your question earlier on of the, you know, of 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 the Aikido moves in these conversations, it's it. it I think it has to do with, with with. Um, with listening for care and curio and being curious. And when I ask somebody, what do they care about in this matter? I have to really care <laughs> in that question, right? It's not a gotcha question. It's not a setup or something. If it's like a real authentic curiosity about a relationship, which might be momentary and might be lifelong, but it's about a relationship with a person and exploring what we each care about and where we might come together in that care. Um, and um, you know, some of you saw the news item yesterday that AOC and Matt Gates and two other Congress people came together on a piece of legislation about congressional corruption. It's kind of astounding. But they found they agreed on certain things. They cared about certain things in common and found a basis for agreement. Um, um, which you know holds out a little little glimmering of possibility to your violent peace activist thing. To I will I will generalize on that and to say that it seems to be a lot easier for humans to talk about what we're against than what we're for. Uh, and frankly, that's partly that that, that maybe it's partly psychological, but it's partly. I don't know what the word for it is. Uh, Gregory, Gregory Bateson in Steps to an Ecology of Mind had a metalogue with his daughter about uh, where the opening question was, Daddy, why do things get into a muddle? And the short answer was that there are infinitely more states of disorder than order that are possible. So there's always more stuff to be against. But what's interesting is what do you want? And that's what you were asking people. Like, what, you know, what was this, what was this first encounter with peace being important to you? And that creates a strange attractor that people can organize a conversation around. So really uh, rich and profound, and thank you for that. Um, I found the uh, Jordan Peterson clip and I put it in the chat, but the basic gist of it is somebody asked him, do you believe in God? He says, that really takes some unpacking because it depends on what do you mean by do? And what do you mean by you? And what do you mean by believe? And what do you mean by God? And 
a lot of people's heads explode with that and think, oh, there's Jordan Peterson doing his Jordan Peterson bullshit again. But I think he's absolutely spot on. Because every one of those words has profoundly different potential meanings for different people. And unless, unless I know which ones you are asking me, I can't respond to you in a meaningful and respectful way. And it sounds like wise ass, but I find it to be enormously deep and kind of indicative of this conversation that we're having. <laughs> and how do I, how can I have that kind of conversation with strangers? and bots and friends of friends of friends of friends. I've learned, I've disciplined myself to not respond to friends of friends in social media. I'll respond to friends, but anytime I respond to friends of friends or even occasionally friends of friends of friends, it goes to shit real fast because there's not context and there's not relationship. There's not a container of respect and some degree of shared understanding of what the fuck we're talking about. It seems obvious to us than the whole, you know, the weaponized conversations that Pete started us off with partly work because people take things as obvious. Well, I know that you mean X by Y, therefore you're, you know, an idiot, but I don't know what you mean unless I know you a little bit. Anyhow, thank you. Thanks, Gil. Mark, Jean, Pete. So much to respond to here. I would like to quote the third patriarch of Zen. To set up what you like against what you dislike is the disease of the mind. And Gregory Bateson talks about pathologies of communication. And boy, are we right there at a pathology of communication. Um, I've been learning a lot, having been forced to take time off from my day job to heal myself. Um, I posted above, um, I'm wondering if I can post again, it's, it's, there we go, a talk between an American philosopher and, thank goodness, the British the English who colonized the world, tried to make it a better place, failed um, in some ways. Um, you know, I, I think the Indians are very happy that they speak English at the moment. Um, hard to say, but I highly suggest, in fact, I will pay you to watch Peter Bogosian, How the Academy Got Woke, and, oh, it's kind of thrown off my screen, why the new atheists are to blame us, why we are to blame. Um, a take on wokeness very different from anything I'm hearing here. Um, and again, I will repeat, wokeness has hurt more of my friends who are female, um, lesbian, gay, whatever, than anything Trump has done. And that surprises the hell out of me. And I have to ask why. Anyway, um, they talk about street epistemology um, on the YouTube video. It's quite long, uh, but worth, worth a... And I'll give you my money back guarantee. If it wastes your time, ask me for how much money you want, and I will try to pay you back. Remaining centered. I really appreciate what you said. Listening for care. I learned something about what one should do when insulted or triggered. Certainly in trauma care, which I'm trying to go through, trauma co-care, where we learn how to help each other in community, not professionals, we're not therapists, but try to be able to listen without judgment and let the person explain their story and get out the emotion. The theory is 
you are able to release from the amygdala the trigger put it into words and then have the hypo not the hypothalamus is it the hypothalamus uh I'm, again brain is a little shaken um amygdala no amygdala the the center of memory um but anyway to get the to get the executive function hippocampus thank you to get the the tr the trauma into executive function language so you can say this is what happened to me this is how i responded this is how i felt and it moves from the amygdala from the automatic trigger to the hippocampus and the trigger becomes a memory a mere memory rather than some kind of emotional um hijacking that happens through emotion you you are not able to be controlled again somebody said when i said yeah my mother knows how to push my all my buttons my friend said that's because she installed them now when somebody goes off the rails one might ask and again i found this on the internet and i don't have a um ready reference but are you okay are you okay just those three words when somebody goes you are pushing my are you okay it frames the i have care for you i'm in a relationship and i'm asking you tell me about yourself rather than tell me what i am which i get a lot of um listening for care and actually being the person doing caring are you okay tell me are you okay i'm surprised you said that are you okay that kind of i'm going to accept your energy and i'm going to ask for more of your energy but more of your energy not about me what about you are you okay jean are you okay <laughs> people seldom think i'm okay i, I just I noticed this as Ken talked about not wanting to facilitate this meeting because of the nature of the responses from the from the people about about peace. And then as Gil started talking and he talked about master and Jerry's immediate response to the term, we all seem to have our ping points and and learning how to sort of get a hold of them and constrain them before we stick our foot in our mouth is is really difficult and it's sort of an ongoing challenge to to learn to sort of bite your tongue and process the comment before you open your mouth and so it's something that i work on a lot and some places i make progress and some places i don't Pete? Um, uh, thanks. Thanks, Gene. Um, so now after this conversation, I have a, a wish that the magical people who run the social platforms we live on, uh, Twitter and Facebook and whatever, <clears throat> my, the dear departed Twitter, I'm so sad. Um, uh, why don't we just have uh, affordances uh, that um, that make it much more clear that when we're having a high context conversation and and add friction for low context interactions um, and just like tilt the playing field that we're on in social media so that conver high context conversations come back to human scale 
and low text conversations just kind of get quieter and quieter and quieter and, and aren't aren't a problem. <clears throat> so um, so that was my wish. Uh, this is a childish wish. Uh, this is a wish similar to I wish we didn't have a gun culture or I, I wish energy companies understood uh, carbon and climate change, which actually, of course, they do, I guess. So maybe that's my, my, my wish. I wish they would do something about carbon and climate change. Um, and that's a childish wish. Um, uh, not that we can't try to do things, but, but you know, saying that there's this big golem, um, uh, if I can use a, a technical term, um, uh, something like Facebook uh, is a meta golem, actually, it's a really monstrous golem. Um, something like Twitter feels like only like a, a few golems put together. Um, and by golem, I mean something that's high, like constructed and bigger, bigger than human, larger than human scale. And we, we, we humans still have a tendency to interact with large mechanistic creations uh, that are made out of multiple humans as a human thing, right? Um, I can interact with Microsoft as a human. You know, it's a, I, I model it as a human. I interact with Google as a human. I interact with Twitter conceptually kind of as a human. You know, I can go talk to Twitter. I can, it tells me things. I can tell it things. Um, it's made up of the number of people I can fit in my head, which, uh, uh, which Scott reminds us Dunbar talked about the whole conversation about the Dunbar number we can skip for right now. Um, anyway, um, the answer is not for to ask the social platforms to do it. Even if they could do it, uh, they would screw it up. Um, you can tell actually uh, by uh, Musk is particularly ham-handed with his understanding of the, the dynamics of the way Twitter works and the marketplace that it occupies and things like that. But um, uh, you, you can tell that when somebody of good intent um, tries to do something with a big golem, it's like, oh, I'll put a leash around this golem and, and make it walk a straight and narrow path towards high context um, conversations and damping low context conversations. This is going to go wrong in a million ways because the problem is a lot, lot bigger than that. Billions of people bigger. Um, so, uh, so the a, a solution or an activity maybe, an activity that comes to me that I think works towards a solution um, is for those of us who've had conversations about this and have thought it a, about it a little bit, I think we could actually, I think we could, we could craft, uh, craft statements Statement seems like the, a weak word right there, but um, craft a, um, a, an expression of belief. Um, you know, I, 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 and I don't know what that would be. I'd have to think about it uh, out, out of this conversation. But I think I, I have some beliefs now, or I can, I can reflect on this conversation and and go back and read it and think about it and talk again. Um, I think I have some beliefs, which you know. Um, if you start a conversation with are you and antifa or you know do you love jordan peterson or um you know are you woke or not woke we're starting the conversation in the wrong place and and you know i and i don't want to participate in those you know kind of kinds of conversations and so i don't um so beliefs like that um gil had another one i i don't you know, I've learned not to respond on, on the socials to friends of friends because we don't have uh, the context within which we can talk reasonably. And it's funny, I kind of reflected on that. I do actually respond to friends of friends on the socials, um, usually about technical questions. Um, and I realized, and, and it's it kind of much more of a, you know, binary kind of answer. It's not, you know, it's not a big, deep philosophical thing. It's like, you know, how do you, you know, how do you express this in a programming language or something like that? And there's a few, you know, a few obvious answers and not very much contention about it. But even then, when I do that, I'm, I'm kind of making a, a small bet that my friend of friend has enough context and, and shares it with me that I can give them an answer and they're not going to go ballistic. Um, and now, nowadays in the US, you know, I wouldn't, I would be scared to have that. <laughs> kind of same contextual um, 
daring, uh, daring do, you know, on a driveway um, in a neighborhood that I didn't know going up to somebody's house and, you know, wondering if I'm going to get shot. Um, so at, at least on the socials, uh, if they react badly, they're not, I won't, you know, I won't end up with a bullet in me. Anyway, if I craft a set of beliefs and you craft a set of beliefs and we all craft a set of beliefs and some of them start resonating, harmonizing, and if we put that in our about page, um, more is the pity that we don't have about pages as a thing on the, the, the web. There's different, you know, uh, maybe it's on your blog, maybe it's in your Twitter profile, maybe it's on your slash now page. Um, so maybe we also need to make an about page more of a thing. Maybe it's on your link tree, I don't know. Um, but if we had, you know, pretty prominently, um, here's some important things. You know, I, I believe that climate change is real and that, it, that we need to take concerted effort. Um, uh, it, I think we should do more of that. And I think I, I call on our, us as a community to do that um, in a way where we're singing in, in harmony in, and singing in a way that resonates and expands so that we can help change the world and that we can help change the world to be a more humane and um, safe and beautiful and wonderful place. And this, it's funny, this sounds like a childish wish, but I don't think it is. I, I think it's actually a, a, um, a good wish. And I think, it's, I think it's better than the, well, you know, maybe um, uh, Zuckerberg or, or Musk would, would care to hear my pleadings about changing their platform and then they're gonna screw it up anyway. Um, let's not do that. Let's take control and let's work together and let's learn to harmonize in a way that continues to expand and grow. Thanks. Um, Pete, before you go, two questions. One, um, I and apparently maybe a couple other people immediately when you brought up Gollum thought of uh, Lord of the Rings Gollum. <laughs> And it took us quite a while to work over to the Jewish golem, mm -hmm. which I think is what you meant. And my knowledge of the Jewish golem didn't fit what you were saying as a meta golem and, and so forth. I think of it as a, a created being out of mud and uh, sort of an artificial being or something like that. And I wasn't interpreting what you were saying as being that. So could you, could you explicate a yeah. tiny bit? Thanks for the question. And, and interestingly enough, and I apologize Perhaps, perhaps I don't. I apologize for appropriating uh, from a culture which I am not part of. Uh, Golem, G-O-L-E-M, is uh, is indeed a, a Jewish, you know, mythical creature. I'm not Jewish. Um, uh, and nowadays, you, you start to see people using the wrong spelling, actually, which is really confusing. Oh, that's um, so crazy. And I had never thought of those two words as next to each other yet. So that <laughs> happened in my head. So what I meant by a, a meta Golem, I think, you know, the metaphor holds in my head, maybe it does for other people, maybe it doesn't, um, especially for Facebook. Facebook is something where I can, I, I, you know, another thing I would account in there is, you know, the, like the US financial system um, or the, the global financial system or, or the way uh, energy companies work uh, in the energy, energy industry works. But those are kind of like bigger and fuzzier and harder, harder to think of as meta goals. But if I look at Facebook, um, Facebook, one of the things about a, uh, an artificial, you know, artificial is a, a, a creature made out of mud. You know, it's, it's a monster. It stomps around. It makes a mess. Um, it, it, it destroys things in, in, in inconvenient ways. Um, but the golems that I've read about are still kind of human scale. You know, you could see it uh, towering over you. You know, it's maybe 60 feet tall or something like that. And it stomps around and destroys a village or something like that. Um, uh, Facebook is a conglomeration of a bunch of those together. And, and I think maybe of a fractal golem or something like that. If you took, you know, um, not just one 60 foot monster, but uh, a dozen of them uh, and made an, a much bigger monster 
and then you took a dozen of those and made a much bigger monster and took a dozen of those and made a much bigger monster. That's kind of where Facebook fits. It is so big and so large and has so much control over so much stuff. It's not like a, a single golem anymore. It's piles and piles and piles of golems all working together to, I'm gonna be, I, I, I'm sorry to be overly dramatic here. Um, I'm, I get a little bit passionate about Facebook. Um, so while I, I, I'll pause myself and tell a story, I have, um, uh, I have a, a mailing list that's 30 or 35 years old, maybe 40 years old that I've been on for 35 years or something like that. Um, uh, it's a bunch of people who talk about culture and, and being human together and things like that. Um, uh, and it's, it, it, it has always been a, it's, it's where some of my best friends are. Um, I've actually seen some of them in person, strangely enough. Um, the, the person who spoke the most there and who kind of held up the, the whole conversation because she was just so vociferous on the list, she talked so much about herself and what she was living and stuff like that. Her amount of conversation made it possible for us to have smaller conversations within kind of the sheltering tree of her like just churn of, of like stream of consciousness stuff every day. She could post literally dozens of messages a day. And, and this list used to run 200 messages a day, no problem. And everybody on the list was like, yeah, no, no worries. Um, people who like stumbled into the list accidentally, it was nominally about English language, which we didn't talk about very much. People would stumble in and, and like their heads would explode uh, a day or two later. It's like, oh, how do I get off this? Shut it off, please. I can't stand it. This woman um, who's now in her 80s uh, moved over to Facebook five or 10 years ago or something like that, and which essentially killed the list because she moved her center of discourse from the mailing list where we all were to Facebook and Facebook groups and stuff like that. And, and it's a beautiful, wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, I was just on a call with a group of the friends uh, a weekend or two ago, and she said, you know, Facebook came up and she said, I love Facebook. Facebook is, you know, a, an amazing part of my life. If I didn't have Facebook, it would make it so that I couldn't keep track of all the people I keep track of. It, she would be bereft. Um, the, the whole world would collapse for her without Facebook. So I have a different feeling about Facebook, the God that is Facebook. I don't believe in Facebook. Um, I think it's a, a, a horror on, on, the, on humanity. It is like an absolute horror on humanity because what it does, it's, it's built to be a golem. It doesn't think, it doesn't care. All it cares about, all it cares about is moving around. When it moves around, what happens is it vacuums up dopamine cycles by the literal billions, which is a, a number you cannot imagine, literal billions of people live inside this machine that puppets them around as if they were puppets. They're, they're marionettes on strings doing whatever Zuckerberg in some like, you know, like fractal level, like way, way, way above you is pulling strings because he thinks, oh, I'm just driving a golem. It's no big deal. You know, humanity's fine. No worries. Um, he's manipulating billions of people to have lives different than they want to have. I actually don't care. I, 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 I appreciate her name is Natalie. I appreciate Natalie and her life. Um, I like that she's mostly, I, I hope she's doing this with agency. But I know from being on Facebook, it takes me about, I, I don't go to Facebook very often, it takes me about 30 seconds to get sucked into the timeline and be scrolling and like watching and like, blah, blah, blah. and I can't think anymore. And I know that the billions of people in Facebook aren't so much more well trained than me to, to resist that. So, you know, when, it, when Facebook says, you know, Facebook knows like, thousands of posts that it could give you and it also knows that it can't give you more than a, a few dozen every day because you literally can't read it so it's picking and choosing what you're seeing it's picking and choosing what you think it's picking and choosing the friends for you it's saying this friend over here wants to be in touch with you when that friend doesn't want to be in touch with you it's just that they you know through the the machination of social networks 
they've decided that, you know, it would be great if these two people got together because that would increase their engagement, you know, 0.06% and yada, yada, yada. So Facebook for me is not one golem. It's not the golem of the algorithm. It's not the golem of a CEO who doesn't have the the human decency to think about what he's doing to billions of people in their lives. Literally, I, you know, I really appreciate that, that Mark has done an awesome job of making Natalie's life better, but he has done it in a way, billions of times, he has robbed people of their agency, he's taken it away from them. And he's given them something which is kind of, you know, kind of a faux agency. So Mark, Mark is human, certainly he's not a golem, but the thing that he operates is a golem and, you know, and, and it sits on the shoulders of other golems and it sits on the shoulders of other golems and it sits on the shoulders of other golems. So that's what I meant by a meta golem. Thanks for the question. <laughs> Dang, um, thanks Pete, I appreciate that. Uh, Stacy, thank you very much for your patience. Uh, step in whenever you feel like. Well, I apologize beforehand because it's going to be hard to connect all my thoughts because so much time has gone by. Um, but he gave me new ones. So the first thing I want to say is, well, so when Mark was talking at one point, he said, we're all atheists. And, all this, and I was like, no, I'm not an atheist. <laughs> um, so to Pete, something you said about appropriating the term. Mark, you don't have to answer that about the atheists, but there's no, so as somebody who believes in a concept called God, whatever that may mean, there's no appropriation. Everything belongs to everyone. That would be like appropriating a color. Can't be done. It's all, all of us, you know, it's all for everything. Um, but Jerry put up, I didn't know what new atheism was. So he put up the Wikipedia and I read it and it talked about new atheists are the ones that believe that rather than tolerating the religious, they should be mocked and criticized. And that's what I want to speak to because I really do think new atheists are the problem because while I don't believe that people with strong fundamentalists superstitious beliefs should be ignored. I do think there should be discussion, but I think that it should be the kind of discussion that you would have if you were a teacher speaking to a child, you wouldn't mock them. You would draw them out with questions. Um, there's something, I'm trying to think. So, okay, now I wanna to connect to Facebook for a minute. So with the, with the whole thing about Facebook, Facebook can be, the way to make it a positive thing is when you have your own group. And hearing you speak is making me think I wanna go back and restart my page that I had a couple of years ago because it can be really powerful, but you have to be able to have your own group so that it's not a question of having the algorithms control you. It's a question of everybody can come to the group because it, it, it is really good. What was missing was the Zoom piece of it. I mean, Doug's the only person that I actually met through Facebook here, but I have a lot of other communities that my first contact with them, getting to know them was through Facebook and I would have never gotten to know them. Um, speaking to friends of friends, I do speak to friends of friends when it's a political thing and the friends are what Jerry would call muggles. I'll usually start with a question just to ver, you know, just because I know there's no context there. But unlike a lot of you, oftentimes I have a different situation where the friends of friends are way more educated than I am. They're in these academic circles. And frankly, I don't agree with them, but I'm also not sure that I really understand what they're saying. And so I'll also start with a question, but I'll let them know, I'm not sure I understand you, but I'll also tell them my point of view. And what that does is it lets the other people in the group 
that are also as educated as they are see that what I'm saying has value and maybe see that what the other person is saying doesn't have so much value, but nobody wanted to question that person before. I don't know if I'm explaining the point I'm trying to make, but it, what I'm trying to say is that, and when Scott was talking about these words that encompass everything else, There's not enough differentiation between what's happening in a group. And sometimes that's because no one wants to question the more powerful voice, let's say. Yeah, I'm, I'm all over the place because we've had so many different thoughts. What I most wanted, to, what, when I first raised my hand, it was really about not mocking, but yes, having the discussions and yes, questioning. So I actually like being in groups where there are people. So I'm in one group now and it's atheists and Christians, which I don't love that so much because it's really people that just want to mock each other. There, there's a whole world of Christians that don't believe the Bible literally. I'm in agreement with them. I don't want to, I don't want to separate myself from them because the messages are the ones I resonate with. So why would I want to, those, those are my allies. People that believe in the messages are my allies. Yeah, so I'll, I'll stop there. But um, the mocking is the, you know, is a real issue. And the only time that I will use mocking is with a bully. But that's because that's the world they're in and they might need a little bit of that in order to step back because they're bullies. Thanks. Thanks, Stacey. I want to pick up on one thread that you picked up on, which is why I put the strength of weak ties in the chat earlier. Uh, and that is this idea of friends of friends and how do you manage friends of friends? And Gil had said, I just don't, I just don't interact with anybody who's not a friend. And I'm like, I find that one of the claims of the strength of weak ties is that your close ties, your strong ties, are kind of in an echo chamber and are you're seeing the same stuff, you have very similar opinions, and that your weak ties are where no novelty enters your social networks. And I kind of have discovered that that seems to be true. And Stacey, what you seem to be saying to me is that main, remaining permeable to those very weak ties, <clears throat> but finding a really good way to negotiate entry with them and to, to make contact is really important. Yes. And for me, if I see a, somebody I don't really know, but who's connected through a connection and they appear to be trolling me, I will ignore those. I don't, I, I don't, you know, ignore the trolls is, is probably reasonable advice. Um, you know, don't feed the trolls. Uh, but, but if they're trying in some sincere way to make contact, I will reply and I will answer questions and I will do whatever I can um, because I learn a lot from those interactions. I'll learn some very different way of seeing what I'm thinking or, or whatever else. So I, 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 I think that we each have figured out out of necessity our policies our personal policies for how to deal with strangers or whatever and this is this is like a whole new layer on how to deal with strangers as opposed to like don't take rides from people on the street um and we're in, we're in entirely new waters now and i'm so glad i don't have like a teen or a, a preteen kid that i'm trying to raise right now this is this stuff is just so slippery and dangerous uh, and the forces at play are so so difficult to to corral um, but but I, I'll, I'll wrap there. I just wanted to say that that um, this this weak ties thing is important. And then uh, also earlier, I think it was Scott put in uh, the Dunbar number. We've raised this a bunch of different times. I think Dunbar is much more complicated and less straightforward than we think it is. And I'd love to have that conversation. I will post in the chat a very good interview with um, uh, Robin Dunbar. Uh, that really complexifies the issue a lot and is a good starting point for, for figuring out what to do. With that, I will turn the floor over to Mark, Hank, Scott. How many wonderful, rich things to respond to. Um, I was on the street yesterday and a family with two little girls came by and I said, hi, who are you? And the little girl was in a stroller. And she's like, 
you know, and the parents said, she doesn't respond to men strangers, women strangers, she responds to. The men strangers, she's really kind of sketchy about. I'm going like, oh, well, okay. I'll ask her little sister. And she's her, she's Molly. <laughs> little sister is like, it's like, you know, the, the the joy of kids to connect, make eye contact and interact. It's just like, oh. You know, how come I'm not, you know, in, in a, a kindergarten teacher? How come I'm not getting this feedback every day? Because I don't have kids. Never had, you know, never had them. But um, it's like, oh, my God, I forgot to have kids. Um, so, boy, um, going backwards in chronological order, five spokes around the hub of the wheel. The hub is empty in order to accommodate an axle. Without that emptiness, the cart would not roll. That's what's important about what's missing, what's not there, what Terry Deacon describes as the ontology of what's absent being critical to, well, it's, it's, it's from the it's from the 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 Tao Te Ching. Um, it's like the fifth or sixth. I, I forget where in the Tao Te Ching that is. Um, but I could find it very quickly, or I'm not talking. Anyway, um, Terry Deacon, thank you. Um, and I highly recommend the eight months it took me to re to read um, Incomplete Nature: How Mind emerge from matter eight months of my life um i don't we can't all spend that um i'm thankful i did um but um mary Catherine bateson is a shiro of mine and she's female she talks in, in a, a wonderful wonderful talk on um the long now highly recommend i should find it and post it about aging and since we're all aging um some of us are older than me at 60 um it's amazingly important to to, to take to take a look at but she wrote in an earlier book um peripheral visions i believe it was that there's a difference between two types of multiculturalism identity multiculturalism where i say i'm mexican and cinco de mayo is tomorrow and you can't drink tequila tomorrow because that's appropriating my culture fuck that <laughs> get drunk <laughs> celebrate but no september 16th i think it is is a real mexican independence day cinco de mayo is more of an american kind of uh adaptation or mexican american um a uh, notion of uh, uh, a certain kind of independence in relation to the United States more. So, you know, know your history, um, especially if you're Mexican. <laughs> Drink, uh, have, you know, happy Cinco de Mayo tomorrow. Have a great time um, celebrating, you know, our my culture, our culture, because it's not my identity to be Mexican or Mexican-American or Costa Rican or white or somewhat white or one-eighth Swedish, I can go to the Jewish culture and say, there's this notion of a golem. And that's adaptive multiculturalism to say, there's so many cultures in the world. There's the Tibetans. There's the people in Myanmar who are fighting. They have different cultures, uh, Tamil and, and um, uh, also, uh, Islamic mix coming into East Asia, and take the best and the worst of every culture and mix it together, rather than say, you know, I apologize, I'm sorry, Pete, that, you know, I'm appropriating something from a culture that's not mine. No, Pete, we're all connected. That culture is yours. It's yours for the taking. It's yours for the enriching to, to say, 
I want this notion from this 16th century rabbi. And it's amazing. Look at it. Gosh, hey, I'm going to tell everybody about this because it was from the 16th century. You know how long ago the 16th century was? That's incredible. That kind of enthusiasm of look at this other culture. Look at what they did. Look at the Patala Palace in, in Tibet. Oh my God, the Chinese are like using it as a tourist attraction, but oh my God, it's beautiful. And when was it built? Maybe the 16th century. Um, you know, there's, uh, thank you, Gil, for um, also really, really enjoying the beauty and humanity of Mary Catherine Bates. And I cannot recommend her books enough, starting with um, the book about the 1956 Berg Warstein Conference, um, Our Own Metaphor. Um, thank you, Gil. Um, talking about uh, a conference on the effects of conscious purpose on human adaptation. Thank you, Jerry. So being able to choose how we adapt rather than just how we evolve naturally, quote unquote, in, you know, how when we become our own environment to it to respond to, how do we change the environment that's not under our control when we have control over the environment? <sighs> deep, deep philosophical question. And I went over my time, which was, oh, seven minutes. Damn. Damn, I didn't want to go that long. Thank you for listening. Um, and uh, again, I'm grateful for listening to the rest of you. That's just been an incredible talk this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Hank, step in at your leisure. Well, as uh, Mark said, uh, so many rich things to respond to. And uh, I'm very late raising my hand, and the conversation has gone much further along than what I wanted to respond to. So I'll just respond quickly to two things that Mark said. One is uh, Cinco de Mayo. Tomorrow is Liberation Day in the Netherlands. It's a very important holiday here. So all cultures have their special Cinco de Mayo style uh, celebrations. Uh, the other thing is about, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, the Votala built so many hundreds of years ago. Uh, big article in the Dutch newspaper today, radical Hindus in India are trying to uh, change history, uh, saying that the Taj Mahal was not built by Muslims, but was actually built by uh, Hindus before the Muslims came. But uh, what I really wanted to talk about was something that was uh, very important in the beginning of the conversation uh, about uh, hijacked words and weaponized words and how we feel uncomfortable when uh, using them after a while and maybe stop using them. And I did a small post back an hour ago about the other side of weaponized and hijacked words, which is uh, uh, the boy who cried wolf effect. Uh, no one's interested in listening to or paying attention to these hyper-used words like democracy or peace, maybe very soon climate change or sustainability. I mean, they've been done to death. We've all been there, we've done that, it's so, 20th century, people turn off just when the need for conversation is very important. And it made me think uh, that uh, that's one of the things that's behind the big lie and why people invented the big lie. Uh, and to bring a big lie up to uh, date in the 21st century, the reason that Trump and other demagogues lie out loud all the time is not to convince people that they're right, it's to help people distrust everything they hear or read from any politician or any scientist or anyone who tries 
honestly to have a conversation about what things mean and why things matter. So I don't know what to do about this uh, boy who cried wolf effect. I just want to pose the question for today or maybe next week or another week. So I've got to get off the call in a few minutes. I want to go to the uh, Memorial Day event in the town center, which I posted about earlier. Uh, and it's about having two minutes of silence experienced together with hundreds of people, very moving and very reflective. So when I pop off, I'll also be reflecting on this call. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Hank. That's a, I really appreciate knowing that. Scott, it's up to you. Hello again. So, took a couple of notes to make this concise. This is a story I've told before. I'm going back to the weak ties, which I am. I'm fond of Jerry. And I think one of the themes that has gone through this conversations over the last several weeks has been how to have better conversations, how to bring it down to the individual level at some point, talking to anyone, treating anyone as a as an equal, as opposed to seeing groups. Um, so I, the, this is my drive through story. So I was in a fast food drive through line and I was busy and I had a very low car. And I got up to the line, up to the window, and I put my card out and a hand took it. And then a hand gave it back. And then a hand came out and handed me a bag, which I grabbed and put it in the seat next to me and I rolled forward. And then it hit me. I have no idea who that was. I don't know if they were. Tall, short, green, blue, old, young, nothing. I have no idea. That could have been a robotic arm as far as. And I I kind of vowed, you know what? I'm never going to do that. I'm never going to do that again. Treat someone like they're not even there. And I think this relates to the weak ties thing. So one of the things I've noticed is that a lot of people know who I am in the town I'm in. And it's not because I'm well known. It's because I always see them. And by see them, I mean acknowledge them. And it's the weirdest thing. It takes like, it's it's like nothing. It's so small. And and yet they they know who I am because I'm the guy who always says, Oh, hi, Karen. How are you doing? How's your How's that van that you tried to get, you know, or whatever it happens to be? It doesn't matter. So part of it is in the weak ties is that you actually have to acknowledge that you have them. Otherwise, you're not going to develop them. Your pharmacist, the person who always schedules your appointment or confirms, you know, whatever, those are all, they're not transactional. They're 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 other people. And one of the things that I'm not really just very social, but it's it's helped me practice conversation because I think you'll take this in the right way. It, it doesn't really matter. There's not a lot on the line when I engage with my pharmacist. And it's also not a space where I'm going to have an argument because it's not, you know, I, I can bring up things and, and if it feels, you know, you kind of go back and forth. And if it feels a little weird, you just don't, you just don't go there and everyone just kind of goes on. And I think it's just a neat space to develop those conversational skills and to be exposed to a much broader group of people. Um, that we're actually exposed to and we don't we don't even see them um and so i think that the, that weak ties thing is is an important way for us to 
be more of a community when it's really, really easy to not be a community because we're busy and we're doing whatever. Um, so I'll close with a thought that I had. Oh, geez, this is from 2020, 1126. So this would have been the Thanksgiving time period from the OGM call. And someone had posted something. I think it was on Facebook, actually. <laughs> it was, uh, give me three words better than I love you. And my response was, tell me more. And I keep coming back to this because I think tell me more says, I'm more interested in you than I am in me. I'm going to devote some time to you. I'm going to listen. Tell me more. And I think that that's a fantastic way of strengthening a weak tie in just a moment. Someone will tell you something. They're the checkout person at the grocery store and they're going to say, oh yeah, well, you know, I, I like these. And it's so easy to just go, who cares? You know, like shut up and bag my groceries. Or, oh, really, tell me more. And psh, the lights come on. It's like, oh, I'm seen. This is great. And it never fails. So anyway, that's enough for me. Mr. Homer, you know what to do. Thank you, Scott. You reminded me of something that Jerry's uh, wife, April, posted, I don't know, a year, two years ago and during the pandemic about how um, because we were all trapped at home, our, our, we had lost a whole layer of our network interaction, which was the people that we talked to at the grocery store, see on the street. They're not friends. There may not even be acquaintances. They may just be people we see on a regular basis and nod to and acknowledge them. And how critical that is for the the appropriate and good, healthy functioning of communities. Um, there's, I don't know all the science behind it, and maybe um, maybe Jerry could dig out the post, but there's it, just having these interactions enriches people's lives in ways that they don't realize. And I think we take that for granted, you know. Um, I always talk to my to the person checking out my groceries. Um, I would say, "How are you?" And people will say, "I'm good. Thanks for asking." And this one afternoon, uh, this happened at Trader Joe's, and I said, "Well, don't people usually ask?" And she said, "No." And I said, "Well, what percentage?" She said, "Maybe one in ten comes along and asks me. Most people are on their phone, you know." And I'm like, wow. "That's terrible." I actually have seen um, in smaller uh, stores and, and uh, shops, I've seen signs that say um, no shoes, no shirt, no cell phones, no service, you know, because um, if I've seen people like walk through and never acknowledge that there's a person there doing them a service of checking out their groceries and they're just on their phone with their friend. And I just think that is a horrible, very, very rude way to be in the world. And it, it, it's an affront to my sensibilities, you know, for whatever that's worth. Like I just walk around, it's not like I walk around angry all the time. I just think, what, what's wrong with you? Why, why can't you take the time to connect with this person who's actually doing something that if they weren't there, you'd go hungry. You know, that's actually a pretty big thing they're doing for you. You just don't recognize it. So I just, you kids get off my lawn. It's kind of the mood I'm in. So, <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the wrong address shootings thing, that that's oh my a, god, a, taking on a whole new dark wrong meeting. driveway, the wrong car. Girls gets into a car, and you know, I'm like, oh my god, you know. Um, and that yeah. takes us into the whole conversation about the rage farming that's going on, and social media is one of those places where there's huge amounts of rage farming going on. You know, people want to know why people are going off at the drop of a hat. Well. You got uh, you got industries devoted to stirring up the amygdala of large segments of the population, making them outraged and feeling like they're being screwed over. And the people doing it are the people who are also being screwed over instead of the people who are actually doing the screwing. So, which brings up a bizarro cartoon of a waiter at a restaurant and a couple, and the the guy says, "By the way, why do you charge a corkage fee for a, a bottle with a screw cap?" And the waiter says, "Because it sounds better than a screwage fee." And I'll stop. I'm here all week, folks. Try the brisket. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Mark, starting your timer. We had, um, I've worked for thieves. 
I have made a living from toner pirates, working for a philosopher um, who has the best intentions and basically would knew how to use rhetoric. You call people up and say, um, I'm from S, you know, AB, ABL. Um, we're, we're handling your toner cartridges recharging. Um, what is the, what's the model? We don't have the model number of your Xerox. Was it a Xerox? And they'd say, oh, no, 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 it's a, it's a Canon. It's a Canon 510. Would you like us to refill your cartridges? And they, oh, yeah, yeah, I guess we need more, more, more cartridges. Um, okay, we're going to send you a crate. It's going to be $1,500 for four, you know, a crate of, of four you know, cartridges of, of, of toner. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, who can I get to sign the check? And they would, they would have a, a phone script where they would basically suck money and charge 10 times what toner costs. And this was fascinating to me. And it's fascinating to me at 60, looking what, at what I did at age 21, helping people rip people off. I did it. I ripped people off by writing software to help these people make more money by ripping off businesses by having people who were philosophically smarter and knew the tricks of rhetoric to suck money into their own pockets. Their best performers who are on the phone team were porn stars. They knew how to connect to people. In Orange County in the 80s, I keep on forgetting my own history. And it's just amazing. I have so much more to say, but it's 926. And I went on for two minutes and 15 seconds. That's enough for now. Thanks. Mark, thank you. I don't know. I was in OC in the 80s and I that I, I missed that experience somehow. I feel I feel like I should go back and hunt some of that stuff down. The other <laughs> thing. Uh, again rhetoric in the 80s what was it the gospel of success jesus wants you to be racist jesus wants you to be rich tammy gospel faye of proximity. baker yeah orange county in the 80s tammy faye baker and and uh you know right across from south coast plaza that you know grand golden oh god what was the the crystal cathedral Oh my God, I forgot all about that. Garden Grove. And well, the, I went there once. Uh, I had I went there several times. I had relatively Christian incredible. friends who invited me to a concert. And the first clue it's I had incredible. that something was going on beyond what I thought was the name of the band I was going to play was called Mustard Seed Faith. And I'm like, that sounds vaguely biblical. Anyway. Yeah. Sorry well, to know. My own history I forget, and I'm doomed to repeat it sometimes. That's, I guess, one of my core insights that I just had right this second that's going to change my life. I forget my own history, and I'm doomed to repeat it. Please somebody help me remember that. Ironically, We're recording I, think we, I think we can. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Um, Mr. Homer. Today's poem was really easy. It's a really limerick? Easy. No, uh, although I have some. <laughs> My favorite limerick actually has a bad pun embedded in it, so it combines the two lowest forms of humor. That so, is so perfect for you, though. Yeah, uh, so I'll tell you that before I do the, the real serious poem, which is um, there once was a fellow named Clyde who fell in an outhouse and died. He had a young brother who fell in another. Now, they both lay interred side by side. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really sorry, but you you made me do that. No. That's really nice. <laughs> That's probably the most elegant limerick I've ever heard. <laughs> All right, so today's poem comes from Antonio Machado, and the title is, Is My Soul Asleep? Is my soul asleep? Have those beehives that work in the night stopped? And the water wheel of thought, is it going around now? Cups empty? carrying only shadows no 
my soul is not asleep. It is awake, wide awake. It neither sleeps nor dreams, but watches its eyes wide open, far off things, and listens at the shores of the great silence. Have a great week, y'all. Thank you, Ken. And thank you, everybody. See you in a week. See a few of you far more frequently than that. Um, Doug has dropped off. Guy? The recording is still on. Um, one of the things that um, was wonder about, wonderful about Kiko Lab was we just had an event that was formal. Let's reflect on this informally as friends off camera. Now, I haven't made time in my day for that today, but boy, was that a powerful pattern. And it, and it, it really increased our connection, even though we're just vibrations in the air impacting our sensory systems and a reality one pixel deep that I can you know, cover with my finger. I don't exist anymore. Ah, there I am. Ah, hey, baby. Hey, you know, you know that old baby trick, you know, oh, I'm gone. I'm here again. Concrete operationalism. Yeah. Stacey. Yeah. Can, can I just also throw out like a new suggestion that before we end the call, maybe you just put out like an announce, you know, sort of like, is there anybody that has anything that they really want to add before we leave? Just as sort of like if somebody has something pressing. Thanks. You can do that. Um, or not, not even pressing, but just something that they don't want to, you know, they want to be able to drop off. <laughs> so does anybody have anything they want to add before we drop off? Okay. Pete? Go ahead, Mark. And Stacy, Jenny, you didn't say anything. I was listening for you. The mute button is still muted. <clears throat> You're looking for the app? Looking for it. No. So, no, I, I didn't. I was very happy just being quiet and taking things in and seeing what the. I've, I saw this is what my second or third time only. So each time has been uh, quite different. So I'm, I'm really just getting used to you all. But I, I oh, enjoyed right. tonight and the, you know, and the, the scope of the comments. Jenny, no, I, I enjoyed it. Thank you. I don't want to interrupt you because I'm going to say this ironically. We suffer from male answer syndrome here tremendously <laughs> right we do i celebrate stacy because she's so brave and has lasted out about 20 women who've come and gone because they just couldn't take it thank you stacy <laughs> thank, thank you, you. <laughs> thank you now jerry has heard this before and so has pete and so has scott and eric um, but Jenny, um, we need more women's voices. We really do. We really, really do. Well, I, I take that on board. So Thank next you. time around, I'll I'll pipe up a bit. I will shut up more for you to talk. <laughs> well, any, I don't know about any that. Day, <laughs> any day. <laughs> Please, Jenny, talk more. Okay. <laughs> if only to, to keep Mark. <laughs> yeah. thank you yeah thank you thank you all, <clears throat> all right. good night you all really appreciate it bye